The advertisements were ubiquitous and inescapable. In the city of Modena in northern Italy in 1799, printed in every journal and pasted across centuries-old oak doors and shopkeepers' windows and the box office display of the theater where he'd be performing. The great Giuseppe Giovanni Panetti, the celebrated master of the conjuring arts, was coming to town. The most famous illusionist in Europe, and probably anywhere, who had enchanted audiences from London to Lisbon, who performed a lengthy engagement in Paris, where theatre-goers bought tickets weeks in advance, and hopeful latecomers were turned away nightly from the box office, who dazzled audiences with a pen that could write in any color of ink, with complex machines that defied the known laws of mechanics, with rope tricks and mind-reading and other feats of baffling daring do. On stages across Europe, he became known for having a spectator come up to the stage and in one swift, smooth movement, remove the spectator's shirt before he even had a chance to react. A trick so stunning that rumors spread that the spectator must have been in on it. The day came when Panetti closed up a smash run in Bologna and made his way to Modena. Arriving in town with all of the pomp and circumstance that accompanied him whenever he rolled into a town, in a gilded horse-drawn carriage and dressed as a high nobleman, the chest of his expensively tailored jacket covered with chivalric orders. Imagine his surprise when Pinetti, expecting to play to yet another packed house, discovered that he would be playing to an empty one. There would be no lines around the corner, no throngs turned away. No audiences spilling out onto the cobblestone piazza after the show and swapping their theories about how the master conjurer had made the impossible possible. Every performer goes through an occasional dry spell, and so Panetti, master showman that he was, picked up and went on to Parma, the next city on his scheduled tour, where, once again, despite the usual preparations and fanfare, despite his fame and reputation, the tickets remained unsold, and the seats unfilled. And on to Piacenza, and then Cremona, Mantua, Vicenza, Padua, and Venice. Each time, the same disappointing fate awaited. What happened? How had the pyrotechnic career of a man who had sold out theaters and concert halls, whose fame and talent had made him a fortune, and elevated him to the tightest circles in high society, who had performed in the court of Louis XVI, how had it all crashed like a meteorite from such great heights? One of his most famous illusions involved two columns spaced about four feet apart. To each column was attached a thin leather strap, a little longer than half the distance between the columns. And each strap was reached toward the opposite column so that they met in the middle space between them. And there, in the middle space, suspended by its neck, from the two straps coming from opposite directions, was a dove. The stage light shone on the dove, casting a shadow onto a screen behind it, and Panetti stood near the screen with a knife in his hand. The audience held its breath as he used the knife to slice at the shadow of the dove cast onto the screen. And there, between the columns, suspended by the leather straps, in front of everybody's eyes, the real dove was beheaded, and fell lifelessly to the ground. He called the illusion Theophrastus Paraclesis, based on an old superstition that evil can come to a person by damaging an image of him. What Panetti couldn't have known at the time was that this would come to serve as an apt metaphor, because magic's first eminent practitioner, its first rock star, would later be plagued and ultimately destroyed by the damage done to his image by himself and others. It's a tale of jealousy and revenge, of sabotage and bitter rivalry, of fortunes won and lost again, and as in any good story about magic, where things are not quite what they appear to be. I'm Brian Earle, and this is Illusion. Illusions often tap into our fantasies and hopes and fears, as long as there are people who believe in faith healing and ghosts and supernatural powers, there will be opportunists who create illusions to make those people believe they're experiencing those things, claiming special powers or God-given gifts or arcane knowledge. 
But it's not just our capacity for faith or superstition that gives deceivers an opening. Our hopes and fears of a more cerebral and analytical nature can also be exploited. In the case of Panetti, performing illusions wasn't enough. He would make deceptive scientific claims about how his effects were achieved, and about himself. On the flyleaf of a book he published in 1784, Panetti describes himself as Signor Giuseppe Panetti de Willadale, Knight of the German Order of Merit of St. Philip, Professor of Mathematics and Natural Philosophy, pensioned by the Court of Prussia, patronized by all the Royal Family of France, aggregate of the Royal Academy of Sciences and Belles Letters of Bordeaux. It would be only natural to assume that Panetti was a distinguished university professor, and a knight, admitted to various learned societies in recognition of his body of scientific work. But the truth was plainer. In the late 1770s, students in Rome crowded into the lecture room to watch a charismatic young professor of physics. Panetti, short and pudgy, had built a reputation for giving impressive scientific demonstrations. And soon, faculty and other curiosity seekers were coming to see what it was all about, would look on in awe and wonder as the latest scientific understandings came vividly to life. But what the students didn't know, what only Panetti knew, was that they were witnessing a combination of science and art. Panetti was an amateur conjurer, and he was enhancing his demonstrations with the same sleight-of-hand techniques used by tricksters who set up rickety tables on street corners and at fairs and in the back rooms of gambling operations. But this was around the time of the Industrial Revolution, and with it came a new public interest in clever machines, and science lectures had become a thing. In the coffee houses that were popping up across London, science lectures could draw up to 500 people, and across the Atlantic, a young Benjamin Franklin was promoting a series of lectures on electricity. All across Europe, people gasped and laughed and clapped when a young boy, suspended from the ceiling by silk cords, was charged with static electricity, and a young girl from the audience would be called forward to kiss the boy on the cheek, where she would then receive an electric shock. The electrified kiss, they called it. This is all the stuff of modern junior high science class. But in the 18th century, the age of enlightenment, it was the hottest thing going. For Panetti, it wasn't long before all the encouragement to perform for larger audiences, to take his show on the road, became too good to pass up. He would take his illusions, presented as scientific experiments, to the masses. By 1780, he was performing in Germany, and billed himself as Pinetti, Roman professor of mathematics. And his new career took off, from city to city, drawing gasps and oohs and ahs, passing off his illusions as science demonstrations, gaining an ever wider audience, playing in ever better venues, making friends in high places, making a name for himself. And in the process, he changed the art of magic, moved it off the street corner and the fairgrounds to the theater. No one had done that before, changed how magicians dressed and acted, abandoned the cheap tin props for ones made of crystal and silver and gold, traded the persona of a shady trickster for that of a consummate performer, grand manners, tailored clothing, theatrical gestures. And on he went, with his automaton that could answer questions from the audience, his mechanical bird that could sing any tune you asked it to, with his mysterious potted tree that grew real oranges right before your eyes, from city to city, becoming the talk of every town he was in, and all the while boasting of preternatural powers, audiences watching miracles unfold on a stage set with silk curtains and chandeliers in ornate furniture and props made of gold and silver. And becoming bolder and more ostentatious, he had taken to dressing like a general or nobleman on stage, would change his gold-embroidered clothes three or four times during a single performance. In Prussia, his flaunting backfired on him, when he arrived in the capital city in a coach drawn by four white horses, 
and the king of Prussia, Frederick the Great, strolled by in a much plainer coach, pulled by only two horses. He saw his guard salute a man he had never seen before, and when he learned that he had been upstaged by a Roman professor of mathematics, Frederick ordered Panetti to leave the city within 24 hours. But the audiences kept coming and eating it up, talking for days about illusions like the golden head trapped in a goblet that could move under its own powers. And it wasn't long before a lawyer named Henri de Cromp had had enough. De Cromp was an amateur magician himself and saw through Panetti's bluster, knew that, despite what Panetti said about scientific forces and little understood principles of this and that, he was just doing magic tricks. That his automatons were not the mechanical marvels he said they were. They were operated by simple puppetry by a backstage assistant. He knew the secrets behind all of Panetti's repertoire, or at least he knew most of them. And so, in 1874, he published an expose revealing all of the secrets and it became a bestseller. Panetti wasn't going down without a fight. Two can play at the game of defamation of character. And so one night, he took to the stage and before the start of the show addressed the crowd. No doubt many of you have heard of a book by a Mr. de Cromp, he said. It's complete nonsense written by an inept. And before he could finish his sentence, a man sprang to his feet and shouted, How dare you insult my work? All eyes in the crowd were on this little man, dirty, shabbily dressed, with poor manners and speech. The crowd began to boo and hurl insults, and security was ordered to throw the man out. But Panetti kept his cool and accompanied the man to the door. And seeing the state that his clothes were in, and with an outward show of sympathy for the downtrodden, he gave him a few coins for all to see and showed him out. Of course, this wasn't really to cromp. Panetti had hired a man off the street to pose as de Cromp and stage the disturbance. But the damage was already done. Panetti had been exposed as a mere magician, and the crowds started to thin out. Even though de Cromp didn't get everything right in the book, it didn't matter. If nothing else, it took away whatever element of surprise and suspense was to be had from the effects. Panetti's only option was to come up with something bigger and better. So he went off to the French countryside to work on new material, and in 1784 he published a book of his own, Physical Amusements and Diverting Experiments. He gave away the secret of his shirt steel. He really wasn't using confederates. He provided methods for changing the color of a rose, for making a card disappear from one hand and reappear in the other, for simulating mind reading. And in 1789 he arrived in London, in France, the revolution was underway, and theater attendance was down across the board. But he gave audiences in London something the world had never seen before, a clairvoyant act where his wife sat blindfolded on the stage and could identify objects taken from a spectator's pocket or messages written on a piece of paper. This kind of act is still popular today, and as far as anyone knows, it can trace its roots back to a stage in London at the turn of the century. But as stunning as the act was, Panetti couldn't get out from under the shadow cast on him by de Cromp's book, or by the other exposés that followed in the next decade, a second book published by de Cromp, a series of newspaper articles published by a German professor of physics, and the worst was yet to come. Maybe Panetti had grown tired of the exposés, or maybe he was just out for blood, or maybe it was just the act of a jealous man with an outsized ego, but what he did next would mark the beginning of the end. In 1789, Panetti was performing in Naples, when he came to learn that a nobleman and physician named Count de Grisi had figured out many of his tricks and had been performing them for his aristocratic friends at private gatherings. So Panetti hatched a cruel plan, he would befriend de Grisi and encourage him to put on a public performance. At first, de Grisi was timid about performing on stage, but Panetti flattered and cajoled him and eventually appealed to his charitable side and suggested that he put on a show to benefit the poor people of Naples. And not to worry, Panetti assured him, he would be there backstage to help out if anything went wrong. When de Grisi finally agreed and announced the show, it caught the attention of the king, 
who attended with his entire court. And so there, in August of 1798, the nervous first-time performer took to the stage. For his first effect, he approached the king, seated in his private box, and asked him to pick a card from a deck. The king withdrew a card, looked at it, and made a face that let de Gricey know that he was not pleased. The confused de Gricey could do nothing but look on, dumbfounded, until the king threw the card to the floor of the stage in anger. With the audience watching, de Gricey picked up the card from the stage where he saw written on it a scandalous insult to the king. There was no question who had written it, or why. No attempts by de Gricey to explain himself made any difference. He rushed off the stage in anger and embarrassment, looking for a confrontation with Panetti, who was nowhere to be found. Panetti had had his revenge, but he wouldn't have the final word. So, back to that scene in Modena. All those unfilled seats, unsold tickets, and then Parma and Piacenza and Cremona and so on. What did happen, and how had it all happened so suddenly? De Gricey, humiliated and cast out of the Naples social set, hell-bent on revenge and redemption, retreated and went into hiding, where he spent nearly a year developing material for an act the world had never seen before, better than anything Panetti had done, bigger and flashier and more eye-popping than the most spectacular spectacle. But being good wasn't enough. Being the best wasn't enough. Being better than Panetti was all that mattered. So when de Gricey learned that Panetti would be coming to Modena, his plan was simple. He would perform there himself in the weeks leading up to Panetti's arrival. When Panetti arrived, the town had already been wowed by de Gricey and had had its fill of magic. And on like this he went, packing houses top to bottom all across Italy, always one step ahead of Panetti, always taking the wind out of Panetti's sails making him look like an also-ran. Despite all attempts from Panetti to best his rival, he couldn't tip things in his favor. Even performing head-to-head -head with de Gricey, renting the theater across the street from where he was performing, was fruitless. Panetti had no choice but to admit that he had been beaten at his own game, and that his career as the reigning king of conjurers was finished. And so Panetti went on to Russia, where he originally did well as a performer, found his way once again into high society. But his final humiliation was yet to come. Though he'd made a fortune performing in Russia, he lost it all investing in a venture that chartered hot air balloon rides. And when his health began to fail, he was taken in by a friend, where he lived out the rest of his life, dying penniless at 50 years old. Illusion is written and produced by me, Brian Earle. Search for Illusion Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and find show notes, etc. at illusionpodcast.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and please consider leaving a review. It's a quick and simple way to show support, and it helps the show to grow.